Hello. Good evening, everybody. Great to be with you guys this evening. I get the privilege of introducing this fine gentleman to my right, your left, um, because Binge is not with us this evening, but we have the privilege of hearing from Rob Conant. I first got to hear um, a little bit about Rob's um, just kind of curriculum on politics according to the scriptures. Was it was it a year ago when you Maybe, talked about it? Yeah, year, year and a half. Yeah, about a year and a half ago, Rob led a faith academy class. Was anybody in here a part of that faith academy class? No? Oh, fantastic. It's like a fresh, no it's like a brand new, no repeats. Awesome. That's a teacher's dream. So this is all going to be fresh material to you guys. Um, but anyway, I, I remember Rob um, came in and he gave me a, a stack about this thick of content. And I was amazed at just how thoughtful he had been thinking through what the Christian's response is to politics and to the political landscape and to, to government. Um, and I was just, I, I was honestly really impressed. Believe it or not, I made it through almost all of the, are you going through that entire? No. Okay. And I said, you guys are going to get out about midnight. Um, yeah. But it was, it was honestly, it was incredible. I think what it does is it reflects Rob Conant's heart. Rob loves Christ. He loves the local church. Most importantly, he loves the glory of Christ. And probably in a time and an age where fear drives a lot of the conversation around the political landscape, what I saw in Rob's content wasn't fear driving the conversation, but a true love for Jesus, a trust in Christ and in his kingdom. And that was just an immense blessing to me. And so Rob and his wife, Carmen, have been here at the church for... Five-ish yeah, years. Five-ish yeah. years with their kiddos and are just an incredible blessing to our body. So you guys have a real privilege of hearing from Rob and um, I'm gonna pray for him and then turn it thank over you. to him if that's okay. Lord, we thank you that... Um, Lord, as we heard on Sunday, that at the end of the age, we can be assured that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Lord, until that time, we're thankful for your word and for brothers like Rob who help us navigate, Lord, how to think critically about being a Christian in what feels like sometimes a post-Christian world. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the firm foundation that we have in your word, that you are trustworthy, that as the psalmist says, all of your precepts are trustworthy and that we can trust you. And so, God, I just pray that you would bless this evening, bless this time, bless Rob as he, um, Lord, just helps us navigate and think through these things biblically and critically, Lord, and, and with the gospel at the very center of it all. Lord, we just commit this time to you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Well, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Um, to kick us off and to remind us all of where we stand with a God who did not want us to be alone examining these topics, would you join me in a hymn? If you stand, if you're able, I'd love to sing How Firm a Foundation in our best a cappella voices here. And uh, yeah, they're gonna turn down my mic so I don't overwhelm you, but let's, let's give it our best shot. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, it is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed. For I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand. Upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flames shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. 
The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Thank you, you can be seated. What wonderful thoughts in approaching a difficult topic that God has given us what we need, and he will not abandon us, and he's here to help us. Um, I love the reminders of that song. Before I get into it, I just want to let you guys know a little bit about who I am. I know most of you don't know me, although I've seen you around a, a many service, uh, usually with my rowdy kids in the back row trying to not be uh, distracting. Um, oh, by the way, if you would like notes for the evening... You can scan this, and if anyone would like a hard copy, just raise your hand, and Grant is willing to hand out a few of those. I've got 10, so the first 10 hands up. You guys got them. Uh, all right. So uh, my name is Rob. Actually, Rob, it, it, you go through these cycles of life stages. You start with Bobby, and then my grandma called me Robbie, and then you go to Rob when you're kind of cool. And... You become a professional as Robert, and either when you open an auto shop or you retire, you have to go by Bob. So I am Rob. That should tell you that I am here still trying to hold on to what I've got left that's cool and not willing to admit that I'm a professional yet. I am a white geek from the 80s. You can tell by my hair and my calculator watch. Yep, that's a Casio. My hair was whack, you might say. I met my wife in Flagstaff, Arizona, and she was crazy enough to marry me a week after I graduated undergrad and drive up here a month later, and we've been in Boise since 2006. Her name is Carmen. Uh, she made the cookies in the back. Please help yourself, or else I'll have to give them to the youth. Uh, we have four children. We have Ella. We, her whole name is Esperanza. Little meanings of their names there. Um, our, our, let's see, second eldest is Anastasia. Our eldest is Patrick. And we've been blessed with the baby is Catherine Zoe. We call her KZ after Zoe, God's perfect spiritual life. So we have a lot of fun. They consume all of my free time. Um, but over the years, I, well, let me, I'll give you the whole quick story in 30 seconds here. I was born in Phoenix. I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering, so that's my profession. So if you wonder why I'm so kind of screwed up, that's why. Um, from NAU, go Lumberjacks. Crickets. Uh, all right. Uh, I have a master's from BSU. Maybe some more people wait, might resonate there. In 2010. Uh, same electrical technical bent, but I have a Master of Arts in Biblical and Theological Studies. So the Tin Man does have a heart. That A stands for arts, and uh, I do try and connect with people. Uh, I've worked at a number of places, NASA, L3 Communications, Micron. I'm currently at HP, not very far from here. So uh, my ministry background involves technology, uh, missions, worship, teaching, and a number of years in the valley here in an eldership role. Um, I've, I've traveled to a number of countries dozens of times doing uh, either inner city ministry or remote missions work in Mexico. I'd love to talk to anybody about that kind of stuff. But enough about me. Let's talk about why we're here. Government or religion and politics. Man, did I draw the short straw. We're not supposed to talk about either of these things in public and certainly not both together, and yet here you are. Well, I wonder if our church has anything to help us here. Hey, it does. We have a doctrinal statement. Is that almost clear enough? Yeah, it is. So we've got this doctrinal statement that says we need to be focusing on the complete written word of God, which is free of error in all it teaches the full counsel of God. So note the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture here. One way to say that is it's true in everything that it affirms. Some people have cop-outs about this. They say, well, it's true in matters of faith and practice, but they kind of let other things slide by if they don't quite agree with the Bible. But no, we are here saying God inspired this. It is true in anything that it says. That means the passages that talk about government are relevant to us, and we can learn from them, and we must submit to them. Uh, note the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. So it is 
the written authority, the only written authority. We're not supposed to be going and looking for things that could trump Scripture. Now, we can pull some wisdom and truth alongside of Scripture or, let's say, underneath it, um, but it is sufficient. It is the standard. And notice we're supposed to read the full counsel of God. So you're not allowed to have a favorite verse with regards to theology, right? You've got to read the whole thing. Now, the question is, does it talk about principles for government? And we're going to find, oh, yeah, it does. A lot. Let's go to the second paragraph of our church doctrinal statement. Man, this is so helpful. There is one God who exists in three persons, and the second sentence there, in the unity of the Godhead. So note the trinity and unity of God. Is that applicable to us as we study Government, does it apply to considering government? I'm going to show you a, a key verse here in, a, in one of my favorite photos of a past life. But the verse is, that they, may be, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So we open with that statement that they may all be one. So God wants us believers to be united. This is a picture from the balcony at a previous church taking communion together. I know at least one brother who was probably in that room tonight. It's wonderful to remember that. It's just a wonderful time of communion, of unity as believers saying, yeah, we are here before God united in our commitment and reliance upon Christ. And we are to be one and if we are one, we are reflecting and modeling the unity of God to the world. If we are one, we can be in the Trinity, part of its unity. And if we do that, then the world can believe. Flip that around. If we don't do that, the world won't believe. What are we doing if we are acting in a dis unified way. So here I am talking about the government saying, hey, can we have unity in this discussion? What a crazy thought. So the, the, the question tree would go something like this. Can we agree on the Trinity? If we can, can we agree on the unity of the Father and the Son, their closeness? You can feel in the gospel, John three sixteen, right? The Father sent his Son he, he loved the world so much, he was willing to strain, you could say, or stretch that unity because of love for us. Once you confess the name, we are one in Christ. Um, we are to model unity to the world, even. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Um, this includes politics, areas where we disagree. We are still to be one in Christ. If we cannot model this, what hope do we have for people who do not have this unity outside the church? Um, I don't know you. We disagree. I'm sure we do. Um, but we must be able to work together somehow in the name of Christ. Can we be one in Christ? Because if we can't, we need to just go home because the world won't believe, and then why are we here? All right, with that, I'd like to talk about how do we even approach this topic, because there's so many errors that people fall into. If you just sit at your computer for a few minutes, you'll fall into probably one of these three camps. You'll either want to put your fist through your screen, or you'll want to just turn it off and cover your ears and say, well, I'm never reading about this again. Um, or, hopefully, there's a part of you that says, you know, God, I'm just going to submit to what I, I, I know in you and I trust that you're teaching me here. Um, so let's, how do we get there from here? Uh, there's some tools that I want to hand you tonight before we get into some scripture and some deeper things about the government. I call this the, the clear, unclear, vital, non-vital chart. Engineer, can't help myself. And the idea is that if God wants to teach us something through his word, if he talks about it a lot and he talks about it in a clear way, it's probably an important thing. And if it's not an important thing, maybe he doesn't talk about it so much. So the thought is that if God's really clear about something, 
it has a higher likelihood of being vital or important. And you could kind of throw things out here. Let's say, you know, salvation is probably up here, right? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. That's really clear. We know it's really important. So we're going to keep salvation in that upper right corner. There's things that come to us also really clear and vital like baptism, right? Part of the Great Commission. Hard to avoid that. Um, or you could say the Trinity, right? We talked about that tonight. Once you start looking for that, you find it all over Scripture. Not quite as clear as salvation, I'll admit, but awfully important, especially if you look at church history. Now, throw in some, let's, I was just brainstorming, what's an example of something not quite as clear and not quite as important? And uh, it came to me like gifts of healing. Um, they're talked about a lot. Jesus sure loved to heal those he encountered, right? It was important to him. You know, healing all their diseases, it says. But obviously, you don't have to be someone who does healing to be a believer. Um, let's, so money. Jesus actually talked a lot about money, right? They say more than heaven and hell and other things combined. So relatively clear, but okay, there's some, you can have a little errors in your thinking about money and probably still be doing all right. So not quite as important. Um, so you see how all these things are kind of landing in that upper right corner. So we're going to call that corner the focus corner. If scripture is clear about something and if scripture says it's important, we want to dwell up there. We don't want to spend our time talking about other things. Like if scripture is not very clear about something or scripture is clear that it's not important. If we were to argue about that thing, well, first off, we don't have much material to argue with. So it's really your opinion and my opinion and we don't have a lot of facts to go on and, and not much help from the Bible because the Bible doesn't think it's important. Now, there are some weird things down here that are really clear, but they really don't matter too much. Like, you know, the disciples wore sandals, but I'm not here to say anyone not wearing sandals. It, it, it's, it all hinges on the sandals, guys. So there's some facts down there. And then if we are insisting that things that are really unclear are really important, we're probably going to be fighting a lot. So let's try and stay in the upper right corner. And let's try to not drag things around from where the Bible has them. So if you were to say, take money and say, you know what, Jesus talks a lot about money, but it doesn't matter at all. You would be out of balance with scripture. If I were to tell you that how you view money doesn't matter, that'd be a lie. Once you get out of balance with scripture, you are away from the truth of God. If I were to tell you that, okay, sandals are the thing, guys. Get your sandals. That's a lie. It's out of balance with scripture. Or if we were to, another example, like if we were to say healing is super important, more important than salvation. So we need to stay in balance with the Bible. Another analogy, uh, I graduated from Phoenix Seminary and our president for a number of years was a former paramedic. And he had this analogy of theological triage. When you arrive on an accident scene, you don't spend your time and your focus on the people who need band-aids. And you probably don't spend much time on someone who's passed away. You can't help them. So in the, probably the equivalent here would be a non-believer. You don't want to be too much trying to correct improper thinking in someone who's got no hope or wasting your time on the nuances. You want to spend your time where it counts. If there's an issue that is keeping someone from a key conclusion from the Bible, if it's a red tag issue, you need to label it as such and address that. But you also need to be careful taking something that's not so important and raising it to the importance of the end-all, be-all thing, you know, your pet thing, your, your project. Does that make sense? All right, let's talk about some other tools. What's the first thing you think of when you think of a political discussion? Well, there's not much of a discussion, is there, right? There's usually a lot of name-calling, uh, maybe a smear campaign. Um, I don't need to prove to everybody that you're wrong, I just need to prove to them that you're a horrible person. And so there's a tool that I love, it's called Graham's Hierarchy of Disagreement. And it actually starts at the bottom down there of just insulting someone, so name calling. So this is the lowest level of disagreeing with someone where I can just walk up and say, Scott, you're an idiot. Well, maybe true, maybe not, it's not, but it's not very helpful, is it? What if Scott's trying to convince me of something? And I say, Scott, you're an idiot. Well, the thing he's trying to convince me of could still be right. Him being an idiot is irrelevant. Okay, let's move up 
the list here. This is ad hominem. This is an attack at the person or the authority. You know, Scott, you, okay, you're not an idiot, but you really don't know anything about this subject matter. Okay, well, is he right? Is the thing he's saying true? It could still be true. So it's not a very helpful argument. We can, we can move up the list. Sorry, Scott, I'm picking on you because I know your name. Scott, you said this thing, but you just said it in the wrong way. Okay, but is it true? Maybe it's still true. So this is a lower level argument where, okay, I can't really defense against what he said, but I need to attack something. So I'm just going to say he's mean or he's a racist or something. Uh, let's, we're going to keep moving up the list here. Okay, contradiction. This is where I just say, you know what, you're wrong. Okay, at least I'm addressing the argument. So I'm, I'm saying it's not that, it's the opposite of that. That's contradiction. Counter-argument. This is saying, hey, you're wrong and here's why. Okay, now we're starting to have a discussion. Let's keep moving up though. Refutation. This is finding a mistake and explain why. So this is where I'm going to take something that you're saying and say, hey, that specific thing you said is wrong for these reasons. Hey, now, now we're having a discussion. There's one level higher though. If I can get to the core foundational principle in your argument and prove that that is false, then I've, I've destroyed the argument without even having to make you mad at me, right? Well, hopefully not. Or attacking you personally. That is how you would argue as a professional or an expert. You'll find that this goes from a range of the bottom being, well, you can actually fall off this triangle and, and go lower the name calling and into abuse and violence, right? That's where people usually tend. So the goal is to get from violence and abuse and bitterness, bitterness and nitpicking and disagreement up to Argument. Argument is the goal. Uh, the argument in the best sense. So, if I were to make a statement like, boarding school worked out well for Larry, so all kids must go to boarding school, and you were to argue against me at the lowest level, what would you say? I'm an idiot. Yeah. If I, if I don't get someone saying that to me on my way out tonight, I will be disappointed, okay? Okay, what if, what if we move up one level from that? I say, you know, everybody's got to go to boarding school. What do you say? Boarding schools, okay, yeah. Or, or maybe you'd attack me in some way. So an ad hominem would be, Rob, you don't, you don't know anything about boarding school. Uh, responding to tone, maybe you'd say, Rob, you, you said that in a hurtful way. You used the word boarding. Yeah. That's racist. Totally. <laughs> or, okay, someone contradict me. All kids must go to boarding school. If you were going to contradict me, what would you say? Or you'd say, all kids shouldn't go to boarding school and not even give a reason, right? Okay, counter-argument. Hey, some kids really like public school, Rob. Or refutation. Hey, Larry's not like all kids, Rob. Or if you were gonna get to the central point, you could say, Rob, I met Larry. The guy was a jerk. It really didn't work out for him. Maybe all kids shouldn't go to boarding school. Maybe you're totally wrong. And so you see how you can work your way up right? Get to someone's fundamental argument. Leave the peripheral things aside. Argue like an expert. Another hang-up we're going to have is the echo chambers of social media. This is an actual map of which video type social media links link you to other right or left-winged video types. And you can see there's a really small crossover in the middle where you might be able to drift from one side or another. But when you're in a system or a program, the algorithm is designed to feed you things that you want to hear. And so this leads to a number of problems. This is what we call the echo chamber effect, right? Um, the, the diversity of the sources and the links clicked by users is significantly lower on social media than in search engines. So social media knows what you want to hear. They want to keep you in and clicking and loving it. And, and they know that if they make you mad, you might go somewhere else. Um, this polarizes people's viewpoints, it, at least to what's called confirmation bias. So if you have an idea and you search for that idea, you're going to get a bunch of videos that likely agree with that idea, whatever the idea might be. And that's one of the problems with having a multitude of different views out there when you can focus on a narrow area of those views and only get those. So you get less diverse exposure and there's also less discussion. Uh, 
This will often lead to confirming false information. So that little piece of false information will be bouncing around the same videos and links, and you'll feel really comfortable with that piece of information because it's confirmed by so many sources that are all really closely tied in viewpoint. And it lowers the bar for critical thinking. And we'll get to that in a second, but the Proverbs really help us out here. Proverbs 15, 21 to 23. Folly is a joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understanding walks straight ahead. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. So the question here is, do you think that the many advisors that we're talking about in this proverb all had the same viewpoint? They'd be totally useless, right? So our goal here is to minimize the echo chamber effect via many perspectives. Now, hopefully they're true perspectives, but they can be people of different backgrounds or different viewpoints. There's a rule in some historic circles called the 10th man rule that if ever you're on a team or even a jury, and once most of the group has gone a certain way out of commitment to the truth, you go the other way just to bring the discussion up, just so the questions get asked. Um, the modern equivalent for this would be for every few people that you follow, try following somebody who disagrees with you. Uh, one from the other side. Uh, for me, I, I work well with Asia. I, I do a lot with Asian news, and, and American news has a certain viewpoint on China, but you can go out there and follow the China Daily News, and you'll be shocked at how they present the same stories from a very different angle, from a, a different uh, cultural viewpoint. Um, but the goal is truth and compassion, not sidedness, right? Um, and, and we can even get stuck here um, agreeing over a biblical principle or a fundamental problem, but not the data or the solution. And, and all truth is God's truth. Um, there's, there's a wonderful quote that's helped me. It says, you don't really believe something complicated until you flip-flopped on it. You're thinking about it, you're thinking about it, and then you realize, oh, wow, there's this over here. Oh, wow, I haven't considered that. Oh, yeah, let's go explore that for a while. Oh, you know what? I'm, I, I'm still mainly over here. Uh, an example of this for me in my growth and my faith is I used to be a pretty confrontational Calvinist. And it's my previous church and years and years there of people with more diverse backgrounds has really helped me in my approach to people. Now, I haven't abandoned that faith, that, those core beliefs, um, but I've really changed my approach. Um, be able to appreciate the other side. Okay, let's continue on this discussion of our approach. So our goal is to utilize the full counsel of God, focus on the clear and vital things in unity, unity in Christ, unity in submission to the Bible with respectful disagreement and minimize echo chambers. With that, we are ready to get started. Whew. I want to throw out a book recommendation to you guys. I steal a lot of information from this book tonight. It's called Politics According to the Bible by Wayne Grudem. Anyone ever heard of Grudem? He's a professor at Phoenix Seminary. Uh, I, lo I love the guy. Um, in fact, if we have time at the end, I'll throw up a slide of, of my interactions with him that's really helped me. So let's get into five flawed views about Christians and government. Uh, here are the things that we are going to not quite shoot down, but talk about some of the nuances of and say, you know, that's not quite Right. The first one is, government should compel religion. The second is, government should exclude religion. The third is, all government is evil and demonic. The fourth is, do evangelism, not politics. And flipping that around, do politics, not evangelism. So let's touch these one at a time. And then we'll get into what, what a slightly better view is. So, first, government should compel religion. I tried to have fun with the pictures. Hopefully, you guys enjoy those. What does this view say? This says, well, I think that it's pretty clear what this view says, right? It, it, government should be able to go in and force people, hey, you're, you're all Christians now, and if you're not, we're, we're going to put a gun to your head, and, and we're going to get a confession of faith, and, and boom, you're a Christian, right? And we're going to label you all as Christians and treat you all as Christians, and you better not say you're not, or else we're going to make life really miserable for you. And there's a lot of societies around the world that live this way. Um, why is this not a good approach? 
Jesus himself said, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So he's bringing up the concept that there may be some things in the world that are Caesar's and we're to leave those alone. And there may be some things in the world that are God's and we're to leave those alone. With God, and He's distinguishing two realms of influence. And as we walk through tonight, we're going to piece that together with other things the Bible teaches about the realm of the government and, and why God made governments and how we are not to force people into faith. And, and let's talk about well, I just mentioned those two spheres of influence. So, um, two spheres of influence one for the government, one for the religious life of the people of God. And it's not that never shall the two meet, but we're not going to force one on the other. Um, I, one of the things I love about scripture is how many examples there are that we can call on. And so you could ask the question, like, wouldn't it be great if there was an example of the disciples asking Jesus to force someone to believe something? And hey, there is, right? Hey, should we call fire from heaven? They won't refuse you then. And what did he say? Like, no, faith is not something we are going to force upon them. If you look at how God works with you throughout your life, just reflect. I mean, certainly there are moments where he's screaming at you, but there's a lot more moments where he's whispering at you. Um, there's a nature of genuine faith that it cannot be forced. Historically, you can make a lot of people labeled Christians if you try and force them to be. Uh, but we call those in name only Christians, right? There's a lot of falling away if the tide turns. And Jesus is not there, throwing it down, establishing his worldly kingdom yet. So the conclusion here is we need to be clear in our desire for freedom in religious affairs for all. Or you might say authentic expression for all. We want to know where people are really at. If we force them to be somewhere, they're probably going to look like they're the thing we are trying to force them to be. Uh, so compelling religion is a major objection that the world has to why not have more Christians in power. They're afraid that we're going to force Christianity upon them. Now, we're going to get to that in a minute, but often they're confusing voting for Christian principles as forcing Christianity on them. And we're going to get to how do we separate the reasons behind a law from the law itself. So let's ignore that for now. Um, but we need to be able to quickly remind people that forcing religion is, is a non-Christian idea. All right. Any questions there? Let's go to the next one. Government should exclude religion. I think this is a much more common view in our world today. So keep it home, keep it quiet. No influence, no prayers, no mention of God. Keep them out of the schools. And freedom of religion quickly becomes freedom from religion. Instead of allowing for Christian influence, the default will be a prejudice against it. Uh, and this removes God's teaching about good and evil from all areas of government or government-funded programs. Uh, we're no longer able to counsel people on good things based on scripture. And this makes the government or the school system completely secular and this removes morality. So this is clearly against God's plan for government. And we'll get into some of those principles. Um, it, as mentioned before, it, it fails to distinguish the reasons for a law from the law itself. And a great example of this is laws against murder. Um, the world doesn't realize that Christianity is one of the chief arguments for not having murder, right? You can argue of a lot of different things, but the church is here saying, you know what? God says it's not right, and, and we put laws supporting this from various perspectives through many societies and many cultures throughout all history, and they're not standing up saying, well, we need to remove that law. It's too Christian. Even though the reason behind the law is very Christian. They're, they're picking and choosing which laws they label as Christian laws. Uh, there are reasons, religious reasons, behind many of our laws, but this is not the establishing 
of a religion. This is merely upholding good moral principles justified from our perspective. Um, in fact, the, the First Amendment really bring, makes this clear, right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This is a wonderful dual mandate law, right? You have to not establish one and protect free expression. As soon as you abandon either of those things, you're going against that amendment. There's wonderful stories about um, pastors standing up to protect freedom of expression in the face of things like IRS law against endorsing a political candidate. Uh, in fact, Wayne Grudem was participated in a series of sermons all preached on a specific date and um, Alliance Defending Freedom mailed these sermons to the IRS ahead of time and said, hey, by the way, we are going to be preaching these sermons on this date in all these locations. And they sat there just waiting for the lawsuit, which never came because they knew they could win because of this amendment. And so the IRS is very hesitant to press people on their endorsement of political candidates because of these freedom of expression principles. Uh, the Declaration of Independence itself claims divine authorization for the existence of our nation. So should we just throw that out because it's religious? All right, let's go to the next one. All government is evil and demonic. This claims that all government or any power over someone or any authority is worldly and Worldly authorities are the realm of Satan. Anyone ever heard that from someone? So this is often used in combination with Christ's peaceful message of turn the other cheek and emphasizing Satan's worldly power or authority. Um, it would, this view would claim that any use of force or power is evil, um, and Christians therefore must use friendly tactics only, usually pacifistic. Uh, now, I'm not here to say that I think um, all pacifists are wrong or that God could not call someone to be a pacifist. Uh, I'm speaking more from general biblical principles, um, but the, this is how it's often portrayed, is that Jesus never talked of using force in a positive way or of government authority. Uh, be careful with arguments like Jesus never said, because if that is your benchmark, you have to ignore all other biblical evidence. Um, and to look only at the explicit teachings of Jesus rather than the teachings of the whole Bible, you actually miss out on the Great Commission where Jesus says, you know, go make disciples, teach all that I've commanded you. And he referenced all of scripture. So the Bible, the whole Bible comes with the authority of God and the authority of Jesus Christ. So we have to consider it all. What if the main teaching on civil government is found in other places? We cannot ignore Genesis 9 or Exodus or Deuteronomy or Judges or 2 Chronicles or we'll read in a minute Romans 13 or 1 Peter. We cannot neglect those passages. Um, there's, there's other places where you can see that Jesus is not fully against concepts like self-defense. Just quickly, there's an interesting verse to me that where Jesus talks about the strong man fully armed. If he, I think the idea is that his goods, his household is safe with the assumption that a strong man is gonna protect his household. He, he's gonna defend himself, his wife, his children, his property. Um, and he doesn't seem to contradict that. To Peter in the garden, he says, put your sword away, put your sword in its place, not throw it away. Um, and this, old picture shows just the visible sword in the group that Jesus is walking around with. So not to spend too much time on um, self-defense, it's actually a, a principle that we get to in other uh, later sections in this government study that I won't be going into tonight, but um, Jesus seems to enable his disciples to protect themselves against robbers. Um, let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. Let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. So how many weapons should you have? Well, start with two. Thank you for laughing. Okay. So the biblical principles here are also clearly seen in how some of the saints of old interacted with governments. If we look at Daniel, um, it 
says, the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. So this is at least some interaction, we'll see in a few minutes that it's a lot more than some, of God establishing people in authorities. So not all authority is evil. Let's spend some minutes here reading slowly Romans 13, 1 to 6, where you're going to see that God clearly establishes, excuse me, civil government and authorizes it to use its power. I'm going to go slowly through this. This is a key verse in understanding God's view of government. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Why would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Or sorry, would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. The sword in the original languages here is the executioner's sword. So it's not like the police officer's baton. It's very clearly talking about capital punishment here. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are the ministers of God attending to this very thing. So, government authority is many times said to be established by God. So, you can't start from a viewpoint of all government being evil and demonic. Um, I mentioned the sword. Here's it more spelled out. So to bear the sword and be a terror to bad conduct and to carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer and to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good, these are all some of the chief roles for government in God's eyes. Note God's repeated involvement, even in the context of ancient Rome. Um, Satan is never described in the Bible as in control of all government. God, desiring to restrain evil in the world, has established these two domains. Evangelism, that's the job of the church, and the power of government, the sword, the executioner's sword, punishing the wrongdoer, praising or helping those who do well. All right, let's move on to another view. Do evangelism, not politics. This one, I think, is one of the ones that's more defensible Um, but let's talk about it for a bit. You might say, hey, we should just preach the gospel, or this is the only way Christians can hope to change people's hearts and change our society. Or, okay, maybe minor political influence by the church is appropriate, but, well, it won't do any spiritual or eternal good. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble here and name names, but John MacArthur might go too far when he says, Concern about current trends in government and the community is acceptable as long as we realize that such interest is not vital in our spiritual lives, our righteous testimony, or the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. And elsewhere, God does not call the church to influence the culture by promoting legislation and court rulings that advance a scriptural point of view. Hmm. All right, let's let's look at what Jesus said. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Does Christian political activism do any spiritual good? Well, if we can teach people God's truth in the process, it does a lot of spiritual good. It's directly obeying the Great Commission. If it's part of what God teaches us in Scripture, It pleases God. Uh, We're helping people have knowledge about how they could love God to keep his commandments. Jesus did not only forgive people's sins. I love this about Jesus. He healed them. 
people would go up to him with physical ailments and he cared. Jesus made a point to physically touch the broken, the unclean, the unaccepted. He had a very physical, material ministry. In fact, he would go above and beyond. You'd have someone who you weren't supposed to touch at all, and he wouldn't just touch him. He would embrace him. The parable of the prodigal son is perhaps my favorite, and how much of, how many rules were violated by the father running after and embracing the filthy son? From social decorum to the old father's likely achy knees. I mean, I've been told by my doctor, I need to stop running. I don't feel that old, but apparently running is not great when you get that old. Um, Apparently, the prodigal's father didn't care. Blow the knees. Let's go. Jesus loved to embrace people physically. Um, He was concerned both about people's spiritual life and the well-being of their actual physical life in this world. Here's a quote. Sorry, I don't have a source, but it sums up. Social activity not only follows evangelism as its consequence and aim and precedes it as a bridge, but also accompanies it as its partner. I feel this in my earthly ministry, too. I love working on people's cars because when you're under somebody's car changing their starter, you have this wonderful in to their life. You can chat about things, and they're actually willing to take a lot of advice from you when you're fixing their car for free Um, because they know I care. What's the phrase? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. Good governments help the spread of God's kingdom and vice versa, right? If we can get God's truth into more places, governments that are better will result. And if it's in the Bible, shouldn't we preach about it? Shouldn't we teach about it? Shouldn't we mold our lives around it, or are there certain parts of the Bible that we shouldn't share with our neighbor, right? Once you start being selective, all right. Here's another way to look at it. How, how far outside of evangelism do we go? Well, why were you saved? Can anyone, can anyone answer that for me? Think of a verse that talks about why you were saved. Was it so that you could have a a nice, peaceful, happy life and and zip right up to heaven and be with God forever and that's it? Why were you left here after you were saved then? What's God want you to be doing here? Just to evangelize? Just to bring other people along with you? It's not hard to find that good works are one of the central purposes to your salvation. God did not just save you for you. He saved you for the world that you would encounter throughout the rest of your life. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The good of your neighbor, Jesus' command, includes any area that impacts the life of your neighbor. Uh, So this do evangelism, not politics view would have to assume that politics never impacted the life of my neighbor. Well, these last few years have really shown us the the opposite of that, right? Um, That's a little narrow of an understanding of, of the work of God's kingdom and what is impacting my neighbor's life and the breadth of the Christian gospel message and how much he means to impact. Um, let's see. I love this phrase. The gospel is God's good news about all of life. It, it's helped me in so many times. Often, I, I have a brain that goes really fast, but that's not a good thing all the time. I'm a, I'm a quick spiral to hell if, if God were to leave me on my own. And one of the thoughts that has helped me the most at certain times is just how far-reaching things like the holiness of God is. There's not an area or corner or crevice of the universe that it doesn't touch and change. And the gospel's like that too. The gospel is to change everything. The whole world will be different because of the gospel. Jesus said, go therefore, make disciples, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Let's look at some examples from history. So God established multiple ways 
of restraining evil, evangelism, the church, and the government. The spread of Christianity and Christian influence on government has been responsible for a great many wonderful things. Outlawing infanticide, child abandonment, or abortion in the Roman Empire, stopping gladiators or cruel treatment of criminals, human sacrifice, the burning of widows in India, binding of feet in China, ending slavery. All while establishing public schools and being the foundation of truth behind the civil rights movement. Don't forget the significant Christian influence on the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. God declares, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God longs for justice in every far-reaching crevice of the universe. God cares how people treat one another here on earth. And changes in government have eternal value in God's sight. All right, let's flip this one around. This one's a little easier to shoot down. The do politics, not evangelism view. This is not very common these days. Some theologically liberal, not politically liberal, but people who have abandoned scripture as the foundational principle will sometimes head to this view. Um, you might call it the social gospel. Um, now, I'm going to say this phrase, you know, government will save us. That, that's a phrase that you might think is really extreme, but I've heard many people I know to be believers use language really similar to that when a certain individual is posed to get into the White House or doesn't. They, you would think that the gospel was overturned in how much it affects their life. Uh, it's, it's a subtle, pervasive concept that we as believers often have faith in the government going a certain way. And so we need to be careful to be thinking this in our heart, that the government will save us, or all we need is blank, a certain person or a certain policy. Um, careful how we talk. We can often come across like this without meaning it. Uh, but this, this view, do politics not evangelism, places little emphasis on salvation, the need to trust in Christ, or to proclaim the entire Bible. Um, and basically, no modern evangelical organization holds this view, which is not a good thing in its favor. And the main point against this is laws are not enough, right? Right? We can't just get the right structures in place. We're not going to create utopia here uh, by voting on the right things. And we need some genuine long-term change. And Scripture is pretty clear that that is only going to happen inside people's hearts. And there's only certain ways to do that. And the government is only a tool towards that. So we need people's hearts to change so they seek good, not evil. Um, we need people's minds to change. We need them to align with, agree with God's moral standards. And laws do serve a helpful function here, a teaching function. We'll get to a bit later. Um, so it's not that they have no place, but it's not the end all, be all. And if you only push for social change, if you abandon the gospel, you end up submitting to what are the social impacts of your uh, priorities. Because you, you can see in our... House, 88%, this is, might be a couple years old statistic, but they identified as Christian and the majority of them voted to abandon the Christian view of marriage. So these are people that clearly have some other driving priority than scripture and its principles. Um, they, they are pushing for a, a merely social gospel. All right, before we get into what I'd like to put forward as a good view. Any questions about why some of those views are not perfect or why they're flawed? You guys have been really easy. Everybody awake? Well, I did have a question. Please. You put up a rather lengthy verse about obeying government, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't that fly in the face of the revolution? Yeah, the revolution is a great question. I don't mind taking a minute to talk about it. Um, when, let's pretend like 
let's not talk about the United States for a moment. Let's pretend like you have a structure of leadership. Say I was a manager at HP. I'm not, I'm an underling. I do what people tell me to do. But say I was a manager and I had people under me that I was responsible for and I started to mistreat them. What would they need to do? They came to me and they didn't get any help, right? Because I'm abusing them or whatever. What could they do? They could go to the person above me, right? That's probably the most natural things. Hey, they go to probably call it a section manager. Hey, section manager, Rob's abusing the people underneath him. You need to stop that. You need to stop him. Help these people. There's similar principles at, at all applications of leadership. And it really helped me understand the revolution and to justify it, um, or at least support the side that would justify it, in that if there's a governing authority over the people or over everyone, and there's lower authorities, and then there's the people, and the lower authorities see someone abusing the people, their job as advocates for the people and responsible for those people is to go to a higher authority and say, hey, higher authority, this lower authority is abusing the people. Make them stop that. The problem becomes when what if it's the highest authority in the land that's abusing the people? And there's a recognition that above the king is God. And if you were one of the founding fathers of this nation in, say, you were in the highest leadership level of the non-national colonies, and you were seeing those people get abused, and you needed to go above the king for a corrective action, well, there's no government above the king. There's God. And that would give you the freedom then to, under God, put a structure in place that protected those people. And that might cause you to rebel against a king. And some Christians believed that and followed that and, and fought that for that. And some said, no, I'm called to submit to the government. I'm going back to England. I'm going to submit to the king. And I think both could have been right in, in of working of faith out of their heart and their understanding of where God wanted them. Um, does that help? Okay. Do you, do you want to raise another point? Or is, is, what, what is a big thing in your mind I'm missing here? It's not a big thing in my mind. It's just that was what jumped to me when you brought up the... Submit. Yeah, obviously we're not to submit to the government if they're asking us to do something unbiblical, right? The government's not the authority. Scripture is. God is. And so it's easy to look at Daniel and say, did he submit to his government? Did he submit to the laws about not praying? Well, we'll talk about him in a minute. Any other questions? Yeah, surely. Mm-hmm. Sure, please, go ahead. Yeah, I th and so your question, I think, surely is, you know, how come we don't see more engagement often in the church over these issues? Yeah, I, I think I understand where you're coming from, and we were talking about this through that whole time. Um, and there's, you know, I don't mean to uh, speak for the elders here and their views, but I can speak for, I think, their their workload and priorities and what they were, you know, that they had, what they in faith have as the priorities of what they should be focusing on. And, and at some point to survive, you draw a line and certain things don't make that cut. And part of why we taught that class um, a, a year and a half ago and spent six weeks going through these principles about how 
the Bible applies to government was to, was to bolster that, and, and I really felt their support there. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm trying to say both sides here, is I understand your frustration that sometimes it feels like the church is unresponsive, um, but I, I guess I don't, I don't want to speak uh, to, to them and, and why they focus on certain things, but I do trust them. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, but I, I think I hear what you're saying, though, is you, you would hope for um, the church in general, maybe not even this specific church, to be engaged and pushing in these areas. Yeah, and I, and I agree. I think there's room for, um, as we're going to see the title of this next slide, a significant Christian influence on government. Any other questions before I jump into this? I know I'm burning time here. Uh, all right, so how then are we to approach this? Well, th- this is the view set forth by Grudem in uh, his book, Politics According to the Bible, and I, I really found this helpful. Um, now, we've spent a lot of time on the negative of wrong views, and so we're going to kind of remind you of that. So what is this view not? It is not compulsion. It is not silence. It is not dropping out of the process, and it is not thinking that government can save us. What is it then? Well, it's the idea that Christians should seek to influence civil government according to God's moral standards set forth in the Bible and according to God's purposes for government as revealed in the Bible. We're going to talk about what some of those are. Simultaneously insisting on protecting freedom of religion for all citizens because we know that true faith is something that is not coerced. Significant does not imply mean or angry or belligerent or merely intolerant. We have to be careful of that word, don't we? Or purely judgmental, red-faced and hate-filled influence. But rather, Colossians 4, 5 to 6, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So we're talking about winsome, kind, thoughtful, loving, persuasive influence, suitable to each circumstance. Arguing like experts. We must protect other people's rights to disagree, but be uncompromising about the truthfulness and moral goodness of the teaching of God's word. And we have to be strategic, fight the right battles, not wasting our bullets. Can you see this in Jesus' ministry, him focusing on certain people in certain times? It's been really helpful for me to consider the kind of circles of influence that he had. And he didn't have to. He could have spoken to everyone every day, right? And, and appeared to them or whatever. But he chose to work under the limitations of a worldly ministry and model it for us. When I became an elder at our previous church, I had kind of grandiose ideas of what that was to be because I was a budding theologian and I dreamed that, hey, I, you know, I'll probably die at this church because I can keep heresy out of the church and you know, that's what I'll do. I'll just walk the halls and correct everybody who's got a wrong thought and won't this be fun? And as God has a way of maturing you or maturing me, slowly I came to form these categories of who needed correcting. And it turns out that, well, non-believers are just going to be wandering around in their lives believing wrong things, and that should be assumed. And the real goal is not to correct every little thought they have. The real goal is to point them to Christ, to hold out the truth in love and say, you know what, you, you really only have one core need. Um, and, and once you unite with Christ, then we can talk about these logical and theological areas that you may need some correction. But really, there's, there's not a lot of, how do I say this right? You know, we are to assume wrong thinking to those that are outside of Christ, not be surprised by it. And it, not that it's futile to argue with it, but we shouldn't be um, underwhelmed with their response if they don't have that foundation. The next circle inward of people that we're engaging is believers, right? And you'll be blessed with relationships with believers and you'll find out that they're wrong on something and you'll have a level of trust that you can give them some insight and say, hey, 
you know, maybe you should consider it this way. And, and maybe you'll sway them towards the truth. Um, but, like, my job as an elder was not to patrol the halls of this church and find everyone with a slightly erroneous viewpoint on something and pull them aside and correct them, right? Well, first off, I should probably start with myself. And second off, there'd just be no end to that, right? We're all wrong in certain things, we think. But there is a realm in the Bible where Paul's really clear that the leaders of a church have a duty, almost a policing authority, to muzzle false teachers. And as soon as someone becomes a teacher, they are in a realm of higher accountability and they are to be stopped. And so it is a really humbling task to approach uh, a teaching role and, and think that you are, you know, w- above anyone's viewpoint or above the truth. One of my favorite things to do is steal material from other people. That way I feel a little safer in that, hey, at least I didn't come up with this. Um, okay. Um, Some would say, well, we can't understand the Bible rightly. It's just too complicated. Well, understanding the Bible is possible, or else why would God have given it to us, right? Um, The the most vital parts, the clearest parts, we kind of talked about that, and we can disagree, and healthy disagreement is to be encouraged, right? We can sharpen each other's iron and have good discussion here, and we can even have public forums arguing from the Bible if we do it right, and people in the world can watch and learn. Um, And over time, we mature, right? Individuals mature, and also the church itself is maturing. We we have seen society mature on views like abortion or interest or freedom of religion or prohibition. Um, And those those are specifics that we could get into at some other time, but just examples of how um, the, uh, the corporate view can mature. We should not be afraid of discussion, and we need to stay connected with society, engaging, not abandoning. Um, this means we need to interpret and apply Scripture correctly to each specific instance and be firm in our stance on the truth, but also be compassionate with the people that we are in front of and never forget that they are people that God loves and cares for. And I I used to be much more confrontational in how I approached people with things. I was doing inner-city ministry in Toronto, and we were walking groups through various parts of town and there's a homosexual community and we'll walk junior high, high school church groups through there and and be discussing what is going on here? What does this mean? How would we reach this community? Does God care for this community? What what is homosexuality? Is, Is it a sin? Well, yeah. Does God speak against it? Well, yeah, he does. And I had this presentation that I went through every week with each church group and I was really you know, convicted I need to be firm here. And then one week, it came to my knowledge that I had a teen who was struggling with homosexuality in the group that I was touring through Toronto. And I did not abandon the truth of my message, but my message sure changed. My tone changed. The compassion in my message changed. I had a struggling soul in front of me at that moment when I delivered that message. And I, I hope that it's coming across what I mean to say here, but um, don't forget the person in front of you, right? Um, and where they're at and what they might be struggling with and, and their pain. And don't compromise your message. Uh, one of the ways that I am held to that is my slides are set before I come to see you, right? So, you know, I, if, if I find out that there's a viewpoint that's not going to be real popular in these, well, I'm committed. It's, you know, I click forward and here we go through it. Um, truth and love. Let's look at some Old Testament support for this view about significant Christian influence on government. We talked about Daniel. Daniel was a high officer in Nebuchadnezzar's court, a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. He was regularly at the king's court. Yet he was bold and clear, quote, break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. Let's talk about Jeremiah. He instructed exiles in Babylon, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. True welfare is consistent with the Bible's teaching. So we should long for the welfare of our nation, of our neighborhood, our community. 
Joseph, likewise, second in command after Pharaoh, a great influence, a great political influence. I mean, imagine how much policy he wrote and implemented and considered day in, day out. Moses, likewise, boldly stood before Pharaoh. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king, a high-trusted position. Mordecai was second in rank to King Ahasuerus of Persia. Esther herself had significant influence on the decisions of the king. Many Old Testament prophets instructed theirs or even foreign nations, not the nation of Israel, how to avoid the judgment of God. Wonderful examples of how far-reaching God's truth is. The list is long. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. They understood their responsibility to bear witness to the moral standards of the Bible to the whole world. Let's look at the New Testament. Probably my favorite example. John the Baptist. He's described as being the last of the prophets. Look at the role of John the Baptist, you know, announcing the coming Messiah. What a key role in the gospel. If there's ever anyone whose life and ministry should be totally consumed with evangelism and Jesus and the gospel, and yet here he is getting involved in politics. John, what are you thinking? He criticized the Tetrarch about his wife. It's not lawful for you to have her. Luke adds not just that. It says, John the Baptist preached good news to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done. You got to think John the Baptist was, you know, he had a lot of followers on YouTube back in the day, right? Um, so Herod added this to them all that he locked John up in prison. But John, aren't you supposed to be focusing on evangelism? If anyone is, you should be. John, quote, a righteous and holy man, Mark 6.20. It cost him his life. Not that you're all called to go and die for political interventions or for criticizing the rulers, but some of you might be. And you can't look to a believer who's got this conviction and calling in life and say, you're wrong. That's not important. God doesn't want you working there or giving your life there, similar to missions. So let's call giving your life for a cause significant. And at least for John the Baptist, prioritized amongst otherworldly ministry and evangelism. Is there anyone else in the New Testament? Oh, yeah. Paul in prison. It blows me away. Prison became the avenue of his influence to the governor. Felix came with his wife and reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Reasoned. That's a back and forth. That's a discussion. What an influence. Uh, that Greek word, dialogemai, you can, you can see the word dialogue in there. A back and forth conversation, a dialogue. Very likely discussing Felix's role, his job, his day-to-day, -day, his policy decisions as a Roman governor. How could you not, right? When the governor drops by, it's going to come up. <laughs> this theme runs through the whole Bible. Influencing government for good on the basis of the wisdom found in God's own word. Why else would God tell us how we should interact with government and instructing government on what it should do? Um, there's another burden upon us as Americans. We are citizens in a voting nation. Um, your vote matters. Surely, how many votes? One vote, right? Your vote matters, and your ability to interact and influence anyone else who has a vote matters. So you have a responsibility, therefore, to understand issues intelligently, to be able to share them. Um, I, I am not a good example of this. Honestly, I care so little about politics. I read this book out of kind of curiosity and, and got convicted. Um, I am not a very engaged person in these areas, so please don't consider me here saying, hey, I'm doing it right. Um, but it also, therefore, is the responsibility of the church and pastors to give wise 
biblical teaching. The church as a whole should be taking a stand here representing God's truth throughout the nation and the nations. Explaining exactly how the teachings of the Bible apply to every aspect of situations in life. And that should certainly include policies in government and politics and ways in which we should vote. Let's look at some more modern examples of people doing this well. Well, we've had 2,000 years of amazing positive influence in the church. Uh, persuading governments to place more value, greater value on human rights, freedom, freedom of religion, equality before the law, the separation of church and state. By that, I mean undue influence of the state over the church. Traced in documents like the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, all men are created equal was in clear contrast to other documents in Europe, emphasizing royalty and their sole authority. So Christian teaching led to the spread of democracy and at least a slightly more limited monarchy. Also, we've had influence to abolish certain evils. We mentioned some of these before. Um, pushing for property rights, voting rights, protections to women. So some lose heart saying, well, we, we didn't win. We didn't convince them. We didn't carry the vote. And we may not be able to persuade a majority of society in every case, but there will be many positive changes. It has always been this way. Um, now, there's also been some negative influence, right? Um, the Crusades, the Inquisition, we can discuss how Christian or non-Christian those were. But if we forget Jesus' teachings about the distinction between the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's, it may be easier to fall into errors in those ways. So to wrap this up, we live in a world leading democracy. We have an obligation to be well informed, to vote intelligently. Um, here's an interesting question. Do Christians only vote for Christian candidates? Well, we throw in the point that it's rather difficult to know how Christian these candidates are by their label, right? Often it's their actions that really tell us. Um, so actions and policy decisions, not claims and identification, reveal what someone believes. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So support the candidate who best represents the moral and political views consistent with biblical teaching. I mean, I, I talk to my kids about this all the time, um, and it's, it's easy to, to boil it down to some simple, clear principles. You know, we're, for the longest time, almost one-issue voters, and I can sleep at night telling my kids, hey, I'm going to vote tomorrow for the person who's going to kill the least babies. Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be super complicated. Do church leaders have a responsibility to teach on political issues? We kind of hit on this. And some may be called to, to do it more, some may be called to do it less, but it's part of God's word. There are significant moral issues at stake in each election. And controversy does not excuse leadership needing to dialogue on these issues, right? Just because something may not be received well. If it's in the Bible, we are to, to proclaim the whole counsel of God. Quote, I testify you to this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. We need to model healthy dialogue, especially in the most controversial areas, because we are the ones who are equipped to model that dialogue well. And maybe God is calling some of you to do more, to sacrifice a significant portion of your time or effort or money, or to help influence the local government for good, or to benefit your neighbor in some related way, to model God's truth. I'm just gonna pause here. Any questions so far? We're, we're getting pretty much to the end here. So that's, that's really the bulk of what I wanted to share with you tonight. I, I do have some other topics that you might find interesting, but I'm gonna let you guys choose which of these we discuss. This, this section is called Biblical Principles Concerning Government. Now, I knew I was gonna run out of time, so I'm happy just to have made it to this slide. But let's just walk through these one at a time, and if one of these catches you as you don't quite understand it or you disagree with it and you want more information, um, remember the, the topic and, and I'll ask for it in a moment. 
And just keep in mind that all the notes for each of these are in the, the QR link and the hard copies that you received. Um, so that if we don't touch on it tonight, at least you'll go home and be able to look up some references surrounding that topic. So these are biblical principles concerning governments. Governments should punish evil and encourage good. God is sovereign over all nations. Next, governments should serve the people and seek the good of the people, not the rulers. Next, citizens should obey the government except in certain circumstances. Next, governments should safeguard human liberty. Next, governments cannot save people or change human hearts. Next, there is a specified relationship between church and state. Next, government should establish a clear separation of powers. It's an interesting one. It takes into account the human heart and corruption. Next, the rule of law must apply even to the rulers in a nation. Uh, next, and perhaps le less clear but interesting is the discussion about the Bible giving some support for some kind of democracy. And the final one, nations should value patriotism. So individuals supporting and defending their specific nations to which they were placed. Does anyone have a, a specific one of these? I think we've got five more minutes here that uh, you'd like to see the scriptural evidence for. I got someone in the back. Shout it out. I, th I think, let me see if I understand the question correctly, is, is should we strive to be an informed voter by reading articles and watching videos? Yes. And because maybe you, you hesitate to, get, to click on some of those things, you just... Or because I'm not very interested in all Ah, and okay. So, and so it's like, well, it seems like it's encouraged for Christians to... Yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely a spectrum, and there's errors on both sides of the spectrum. You could be a zero, not engaged and not caring, and I think that'd be wrong because you have an influence, you have a vote, your vote counts. Um, and so you have an obligation as a citizen here to be as informed as you need to be to cast the right vote at a minimum. So let's put that notch here. But then there's a far extreme of involvement that is unhealthy and not desired. And I loved the honesty of Brian Bauman in a sermon a few weeks ago where he said, you know, he's just clicking through social media and he's just a few minutes away from joining a militia. Because I felt that too. You've all felt that, right? Where, where you just get drawn to such an extreme and it works you up. Um, you might say uh, your spirit yields to it and your spirit is only to yield to God alone. Right? A political happening or viewpoint should not rob you of your joy or your hope or your peace. And you can definitely see people who are so entwined in things that they're, uh, they're losing their peace over it. Uh, part of the reason why I don't care so much about politics is I'm such a doggone optimist. I think God's got this. It's all going to work out great. I read the book. I know who wins. I'm kind of just along for the ride. And, and he's convicted me that, well... Part of the ride is voting, Rob. Still have to vote. Does that help? Yeah. All right. Anyone with one of these that we can jump into in a couple minutes? Go ahead. So, okay. This is probably the one I'm most hesitant on, so it's a great one to, uh, to jump into. 75. Oops, and I've got the wrong... Number by it. All right. I'm going to struggle to remember it here too. So all people have equal value in the image of God. Amen? Right? There's not some higher people or lower people. So everyone's viewpoint and opinion, well, or we should say the truth matters and uh, n no individual's viewpoint of what's the truth is necessarily more important than someone else. And we can back that up with certain scriptures. Uh, there is a biblical theme, though, of consent of the governed. 
And you don't see this just in political structures in the Bible, but in a number of different leadership structures where the leader, whether there was official accountability back to the people or not, is often seen going back to the people for feedback and input. I really love what our elders do here. We are an elder-led church. I've been at a congregation-led church and the struggles that are wrapped up in that, but we're an elder-led church. The elders, you know, I believe, literally can do whatever they want. But have you noticed how often they're coming back to us for feedback, for help, for our input? They, they love us, they care, and that's a biblical principle of leadership. Consent of the governed. Um, this is probably the single greatest protection against the abuse of people, right? Is, is that leaders should be accountable to the people that they are leading. Um, and there's positive examples of this in Moses or Samuel or Saul or David or Solomon or in the New Testament apostles. Um, also, government is to serve the benefit of the people. Well, it's really difficult for some people in government to, to even know how things are affecting the people in them. They're not living that life. And so you need to hear from the people to know how you are to fulfill this fundamental biblical role of government is to serve the benefit of the people. That's why government is there. There's, there's a number of evidences for that. Um, Romans 13 is, is probably the clearest one. To be God's servant for your good. So who is best suited to decide what's best for the people? Well, there's a give and take there. Some people are not very good at it, but um, often leaders really abuse that position or are very distant from the people. There's a, there's a phrase that decisions should be made at the lowest level possible. It's, you know, a worldly business perspective, but I think uh, it applies here. There's also a number of negative examples in Scripture of tyrants, people who do not go to the people, or leaders, I should say, who don't go and submit to the needs or the views of the people. Uh, Rehoboam or Pharaoh or the Philistines uh, and many others. Herod as well. There is an exception, though. Uh, Jesus is not going to let you vote, right? Um, that's, you know, we're, we're out of time, but just take a moment in this study, in these reflections, to consider the kingdom of God, the perfect government of Christ. If there's anything that COVID or policy or leader failures have taught us is that God is holy. God will be a perfect ruler. And we can really feel that contrast now, can't we? Um, praise God for the type of kingdom he will bring in. Unlimited power and approval, and you won't have to second guess it. Um, so at least until Christ returns, maybe some kind of democracy. Is that good enough for tonight? All right. Let me pray for you. Father, may you send your spirit to bless the thoughts and hearts of these people, of this church, of the churches in this valley, of this valley, of our voting population, our nation, our nation's leaders. We need your truth. We need your moral framework or else we are lost. We're going to hurt each other. We're going to argue and nitpick in ways that are not healthy and not representative of your truth. And all truth is your truth. You tell us Satan is a liar from the beginning and you love the truth, and you long for people to have the truth and be free. And we just ask for the spreading of that, for your gospel to reach this city, this nation, the world, in whatever avenue you want it to get there, through church ministry, through missions, through positive governmental influences. We pray for key conversions among the leaders of the world. What a wonderful thing it would be for people with a voice to submit to you, to bow to you, to have more truth to share with the world and the good that would result. And we know you care about the people in this world that you love. And we just ask for things that would bring them closer to you. And we trust your sovereign hand for where you've placed us with our limited understanding. And yet you call us to act and learn and consider. And thank you for your word and each other to polish ourselves towards your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Good night.